Hi guys, it's Dr. Greg Hickman from uh, the Andrews Institute in Gulf Breeze, Florida. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity Sonicide has given me to talk about an approach that, uh, that I use for interstalian catheter replacement and what we call down south the Hickman flip. Uh, we're going to talk about exactly what that means and why we do it down here. And uh, we've had uh, a tremendous success rate. We do a great deal of shoulder surgery here at the Andrews Institute and we do a lot of interscaling catheters, and we've probably done four to 5,000 in the last nine years. We've had great success, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. First, I'm gonna show you the Andrews Institute, and this is our little outpatient surgery center. It's an eight OR surgery center. It's eight ORs over here. Uh, surgeon's offices on the top floor here. We have a big outpatient physical therapy and uh, MRI on this side. I have a second building to the right with a research and education department. Uh, we have three conference rooms, a cadaver lab upstairs, and then we have a big workout gym here, a 10,000 square foot gym where athletes come and train in the off season. Uh, we actually have a big, uh, or a 50 yard artificial turf football field behind there, a couple of pitching mounds and batting cages, and where athletes can train and work out when they're healthy. And then when they get hurt, they come over to this building, get their MRI, their x-rays, get sur outpatient surgery, and, and then follow up with their rehab. So that's our little facility down here in Gulf Breeze. Gulf Breeze is between Pensacola and Pensacola Beach. Uh, it's, a, it's a peninsula, so the bay is between Gulf Breeze and Pensacola, and the intercoastal um, uh, sound is between Pensacola Beach and Gulf Breeze. So we'll talk a little bit about the brachial plexus. Uh, we know the brachial plexus comes from uh, the spinal nerve roots of C5 to T1. And when we're talking about doing an interscaling block, we're normally talking about C5 and C6. We know on ultrasound, these nerve roots uh, are hypoechoic or look as like dark circles under ultrasound. And that's how we identify them. Now, how do you find the brachial plexus interscaling nerve roots? Uh, most people are going to start with a supraclavicular view and scan up to the interscaling view. And uh, how far do you scan up? What are you looking for? Well, the first thing, the subclavian artery that's in the supraclavicular view is going to disappear. You're going to lose that as you're scanning up the neck. And then the, uh, uh, the typical sign of the group of grapes that's there on the supraclavicular side, as you scan up, you'll lose that, and you'll, you'll find the typical stoplight sign uh, that's uh, on the, in the interscaling area. So you have the sternocleidomastoid on top, the anterior scalene in front of the stoplight, and the middle scalene uh, posterior to the stoplight. And that's scanning from supraclavicular to interscalene. So what are the indications for using interscalene block and interscalene catheters for, surgery, for surgeries and, and other medical conditions? Certainly shoulder arthroscopy, subacromial decompressions, uh, just a clavicle exc excisions. These, these kind of surgeries are... Uh, classic uh, for interscaling blocks, open shoulders. Don't do many of those anymore. We used to do a lot of open rotator cuffs, open labrum repairs. Those are now mostly repaired arthroscopically, uh, primarily repaired arthroscopically. Uh, total shoulders. Uh, we've actually done about 12 to 15 total shoulders here in our outpatient center in the last uh, four or five years, and we're planning on doing more and more of those. Uh, frozen shoulder manipulation. Uh, we don't see that much anymore because we do so many blocks and so many continuous catheters for our shoulders. Postoperatively, we don't see this frozen shoulder much. We do see it sometimes uh, with patients that haven't had surgery. Um, prox proximal biceps tendon repairs, air scaling block works extremely well for that. Uh, pec major, pec minor repair. Uh, the lateral and medial pectoral nerves come off the brachial plexus at the, uh, at the cords, and, and so if you block it a little higher, you, at the, at the interscaling, you can block those nerves and get good, good analgesia. A closed reduction of a dislocation, uh, we don't really see that much anymore, but uh, back, back in the day in the hospital when patients come to the ER with a dis dislocated shoulder and the orthopedic surgeon couldn't get uh, the shoulder back in, even, even with propofol, sometimes we would go pro do propofol sedation, and if they couldn't get the, the shoulder reduced, then we would do an interscaling block. That was a rare circumstance there. Uh, clavicle fractures, uh, this is the one time we probably, we, we do single shot blocks instead of continuous catheters. About the only time we do single shots instead of catheters 
for our uh, interscaling blocks. So talk a little bit about my, uh, I'll talk a little bit about my interscaling history. Uh, I go way back, I started doing an anterior, uh, classic anterior interscaling block with nerve stimulation back in 1990. I finished my residency at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, UAB in 1990. I stayed on staff uh, there at UAB and started, helped start our acute pain service in 1990 and learned to do interscaling blocks, typically primarily for shoulder surgery. And so um, those worked really well, did those for several years. Uh, then in about 2000, I learned a posterior uh, approach from Dr. Andre Bozart, and he called it the cervical paravertebral approach, where we came in posteriorly, uh, used the uh, transverse process as a guide to walk laterally and get into the posterior aspect of the brachial plexus at the interscaling level. And uh, I started doing that because I really wanted to do continuous catheters, uh, especially for our total, total shoulder patients. And uh, so I learned that approach from Dr. Bozart. Then about sometime in uh, late 2001, early 2002, I traveled up to Duke University, spent a couple of days. They were publishing articles about doing continuous catheters. And so I went up to visit those guys, watched them put in continuous catheters, and then came back and started doing continuous catheters with this posterior approach for our total shoulders. Continued to do uh, catheters just for total shoulders uh, for the next four years. And uh, then ultrasound came along in 2006. I started uh, playing around with ultrasound initially, doing uh, single shots with an with a anterior approach out of plane. And then quickly in 2007, I modified my approach and adapted Dr. Bo Bozart's approach for the cervical paravertebral approach with ultrasound, put the two together, and came up with my, uh, my own posterior uh, approach to the interscaling plexus using their scaling. That happened in uh, 2007. The Andrews Institute was actually built, and we op opened that in March of 2007. So my ultrasound experience and my, my continuous catheter growth started right all about the same time in late 2006, early 2007. Um, by the end of 2007, uh, our surgeons came to me in, at the outpatient surgery center and, and played around with a few interscaling catheters, and they said, Hickman, please just go ahead and put interscaling catheters in all our shoulders. They do extremely well. And so since 2007, uh, almost all of our shoulder arthroscopies have had continuous interscaling catheters uh, placed. Now, when I first started them in the first couple of years, two and a half years, uh, we had about four or five patients that showed up in the ER on post-op day one with shortness of breath. And they did fine the day of surgery. They went home and did well with the initial injection. Then the next day, when they turned their catheter on, had their catheter running, they ended up with shortness of breath. And I was like, there must be a problem with my catheter getting up over C5 near the phrenic nerve. And so in about 2010, I just accidentally discovered while I'm threading the catheter, I saw the catheter kind of flip over away from C5 and away from the phrenic nerve. And I was like, wow, if I can do that consistently, that might, might be quite beneficial. And so we, I did, I have worked out a way to continuously, consistently uh, flip that catheter over, get, keep it in the posterior aspect of, of the plexus between the plexus and the middle scalene muscle and flipping the tip away from C5 and away from the phrenic nerve. Now, here's the anatomy. Uh, as you can see, we're gonna, I'm gonna come in posteriorly through the middle scalene muscle. I like to deposit the local anesthetic right here between the plexus and the middle scalene muscle and keep it all posterior away from the phrenic nerve. Um, phrenic nerve sits right here on the anterior scalene and where, we're, where you see this stoplight sign the best, about C6, the phrenic nerve is usually right here close to the uh, plexus on the anterior scalene muscle. If you go down the neck a little bit, toward a little lower, the phrenic nerve actually starts rotating over away from the plexus. Uh, but where you see the stoplight, it's, it's usually pretty close. Uh, and so you, they're really hard to see. The phrenic nerve is not commonly seen. You do see it on some patients. Uh, that patient we can see. This is a patient where it's a little bit lower. The plexus isn't in a stoplight. It's a little bit lower. We call this an upper trunk where it's, it's coming up from the a superclavicular view. 
and it's not quite got up to the uh, to the stoplight sign, and you can see the phrenic nerve here again sitting right on the anterior scalene muscle. So what was happening on those first few patients? Uh, the first day, we'd put the local here with the initial injection. They would do fine. The next day, they would get shortness of breath because I was just threading the catheter. It's probably ending up here, and the local is going from there right to the phrenic nerve. So we're getting phrenic involvement, and patients were becoming symptomatic. So why do the posterior approach? Um, here's a picture from uh, uh, Dr. Bozart's article in Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine from 2003, and I think uh, in many cases a picture is worth a thousand words, and this is a classic example. And we can walk through this this picture in, of this uh, anatomy, uh, cadaver slide that he put in, in the article that really explains quite a bit. So he's coming in posteriorly, and you've got the um, trapezius here, the levator scapulae muscle. His approach was, was right here. He went down and tried to hit the transverse process and walk off laterally. So this needle should actually be coming this way because we want to go right through this middle scalene muscle here, and here's our nerve plexus coming out this way. So this, the needle should be coming right through the middle scalene, stopping just in this space, and we'll inject there to open up that space between the nerves and the, and the uh, middle scalene muscle. That keeps the local posteriorly. We use a low volume, uh, between 10 to 15 cc's. We have used as little as eight cc's for the initial injection and uh, 15 cc's max. And I run our continuous catheters at four cc's an hour with 0.125% bupivacaine. Uh, the initial injection, we use quarter percent bupivacaine here to get, get our block started and then 0.125 in the pump at four cc's an hour. We occasionally have some patients that will turn down to two. If they're still uh, too, too, have too much of a motor block on post-op day one, we have turned them down to two. Most of the time, four works perfectly. Occasionally, we'll turn it up to six or even eight, but usually four is fine. Again, keeping this local posterior to the plexus, away from the phrenic nerve sitting right here at four and away from the stellate ganglion sitting here at number five. Um, we almost never get a Horner syndrome. Our Horner uh, sign in the recovery room is extremely rare. Uh, if we do get it, our nurse, PACU nurses usually get a little freaked out because they're not used to seeing that. And back in the old days when we did the anterior approach, we used to think if you got a Horner syndrome with an interscaling block, you, you had a good block. You, you were in a good, good position. So speaking of the anterior approach, the anterior approach, we came in with our needle this way. But one of the problems there, if you went too deep, you're going right at the vertebral artery. And of course, if you go super deep, the spinal cord's down in that area too. So that's one of the reasons I think this posterior approach is a little safer. We're staying away from vital structures like the vertebral artery, the spinal cord, and then less vital but uh, side effect structures such as the uh, uh, phrenic nerve and the stellate ganglion. So we're coming in posteriorly here as opposed with the anterior approach, aiming right at the vertebral artery and the spinal cord and also as uh, Bill Ermey showed in his study in the early 90s, if you do an anterior approach, you're going to get this phrenic nerve 100% of the time. Dr. Bozart, in his article, quoted about 20% with his posterior cervical paravertebral approach. So I was using ultrasound one day, and I kept hitting the transverse process, and then I pulled my, my slide, my uh, ultrasound probe back to look at it, and I saw what was happening. And it really made sense to me what Dr. Bozart had been doing with the cervical paravertebral approach. He was coming in, hit the transverse process, then walk off laterally until you get a loss of resistance. I realized the loss of resistance happened after you pop through the middle scalene muscle and you get into this space here. That's exactly where we want to put our local anesthetic. One more thing I want to talk about before we get into the procedure of the flip is, is dual guidance. I'm a big fan of dual guidance, which means using ultrasound along with nerve stimulation. I'd been a nerve stimulator guy for about 15 years before I ever got to use ultrasound, and so I was, I was pretty dependent on it. So when we brought ultrasound on board, I kept using it, and now I found out I think it's very, very effective, especially in certain blocks, the interscaling being one. I think it's very important. Uh, and we're going to talk about this article by Neil Hansen and Dave I. Young uh, that was in Rapham in 2013, where they describe the um, dorsal scapular nerve and long thoracic nerves uh, on ultrasound during the interscaling block. 
And what they showed, if you look at their anatomy, they have C5, 6, and 6, as you can see down here. And then in the middle scalene muscle, you see the dorsal scapular nerve right here, as they, they've identified it on the lower, uh, lower slide. And this is the dorsal scapular nerve. You don't see this nerve all the time. I see this nerve about 40, maybe 50% of the time uh, in the middle of the middle scalene muscle. The long thoracic nerve, I think, sits more back in here uh, in, the, in the posterior part of the middle scalene muscle and kind of superficial. That's where I get the stimulation. So I can find this nerve, the long thoracic and the dorsal scapular nerve, using a nerve stimulator. As I'm approaching through the middle scalene muscle, if I start getting a twitch, and it's a posterior twitch, it's, it's a rhomboid, it's not the classic deltoid twitch you'll get when you get to C5 and C6, and you see the tip of the needle back in the muscle, you realize that's either the dorsal scapular or the long thoracic nerve, and you can change your angle and come a little bit lower and get past those nerves and get into the, uh, into the just posterior to the, to the nerves in the sheath between, in the area between the sheath and the middle scalene muscle. I think this is, this is really important, and I think the nerve stimulator is quite helpful to help you avoid, avoid those two nerves. Again, you can see our stoplight sign here, C5, C6, C6, the middle scalene muscle here with the dorsal scapular nerve right there in the middle, especially that little dot, right? That little black hypoechoic dot in the middle of this hyperechoic line is where if you put the, the tip of your needle, it'll stimulate right there and you'll get, get your twitch. So if you do, you just come a little lower or come a little higher. I like to come lower and come up because I get a lot of stimulation up here sometimes, and I think that's the long thoracic nerve. So as you can see, when I look, when I look at this, and I look on the right, this is one centimeter deep, this is two centimeters, two and a half, and so I look at my plexus is about a centimeter deep, but I want to come under that uh, dorsal scapular nerve, so I start about one and a half centimeters uh, below the skin probe and try to come up under that, like we do with this approach, that's where our needle's coming in this way, stopping right here to put our local just posterior to the sheath in the plexus. Now, this is a picture from uh, Duke University uh, that uh, I got from uh, my associate, Dr. Brandon Winchester, who trained at Duke and was on staff at Duke. And uh, actually, uh, Dr. I. Young, Dave I. Young, we mentioned before, and the other fellows, uh, they placed the uh, nerve stimulator in the historical anesthesia devices uh, uh, area at Duke kind of as a joke and, and, and Brandon and the other guys took a picture of this uh, kind of kind of as a joke and and making saying that uh, in the future uh, ultrasound would be the only thing we need and nerve stimulator would be a thing of the past um, at some point I thought that 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 probably made some sense but nowadays I think uh, the nerve stimulator is still with us and and currently in conjunction using conjunction with ultrasound I think it's very important and important to continue using so the, the dorsal scapular nerve and the long thoracic nerve, as I talked about, if you stimulate these nerves, you'll get a posterior rhomboid twitch, which is kind of in the back of the shoulder. The shoulder will move. It'll be more in the, the muscles in the back, whereas if you're stimulating C5 and C6, you're going to see a classic deltoid twitch, deltoid muscle, and it's going to be very clear, and you're going to know you're right where you want to be. Uh, the dorsal scapular nerve, uh, you can stimulate it whether you see it or not. Like I said, about 40-50% of the time you'll see it. It's right in the middle of the, the middle scalene muscle, uh, but you can stimulate it if you see it or not. If you were to damage this nerve, and, and, and I know that's happened uh, at a major academic institution in, in the southeast, uh, then you can get rhomboid or levator scapula muscle uh, weakness. Uh, the long thoracic nerve, I really can't say that I see this nerve on ultrasound. That's another reason I like to stimulate, but when I do stimulate, sometimes I get the, the posterior twitch, rhomboid twitch, in the posterior aspect of the middle scalene muscle. And if you damage this nerve, you can get a palsy of the serratus anterior and get a wing scapula. And actually, we did have that happen here. Dr. Winchester, when he first came here from Duke, uh, he did not stimulate, and uh, we had this. He actually thought it's so superficial, it may have gotten it with his... Uh, with his uh, infiltration needle, with the lidocaine infiltration. So now he does stimulate, and he doesn't go in very deep with his infiltration needle, which, which is, is a thought to keep in mind also. 
Again, you can see that dorsal scapular pretty easily in this patient. I don't see the long thoracic. It's usually up in this area. Um, so now we'll talk about the Hickman flip. How do I do the Hickman flip? Well, we'll talk about the steps involved. We're going to walk through positioning, which is important, and do the pre-scan, how we prep and drape, uh, talk about the local infiltration, the TUI approach with the needle, the actual injection of the local anesthetic prior to, infiltrate, tr prior to threading the catheter, excuse me, and then in, inserting our catheter with the flip. And then we're going to test the catheter, and then we're going to secure our catheter. So positioning, uh, put the patients in a lateral position, have them flex their hips and knees, and make, let them get real comfortable here. We'll put one pillow under their head, uh, have them real comfortable in the lateral position, have them grab the back of their leg, and what that does when they pull down with their arm to grab the back of their leg, it opens up this area, and we have all this room to work with. If you, some people do interscalings with the patients on their back or just with a, with a bump under their shoulder, and you're really fighting with the bed. Here we've got lots of room to work with, and I'm going to prep. The next thing we're going to do is do a pre-scan, and then when we prep, I'm going to prep this whole area and then put our drape over it, as you'll see in just a second. Here we are doing our pre-scan, and what happens there, we have the patient positions like we like them. They're comfortable. Uh, one pillow under the head. Uh, may have them turn their nose down into the pillow just a little bit, but, but not much. And so I spray a uh, scan, excuse me, and my assistant, a uh, block nurse, will actually take a, a blue marking pen and mark the edges of the probe so he can come back and put the probe in where I want it to be when I've got my drape on board and he can slide under the drape in a non-sterile fashion and, uh, and then I can grab the, drape, uh, grab the probe through the drape. As you can see here, uh, he's got the, uh, I've got the drape on. Here's our little hole in our drape where I'm working through, uh, and we got drape all the way out here. And here's our sterile needle on the drape, and I'm reaching through the drape, holding the probe. The probe's non-sterile. I don't have to worry about putting sterile jelly on the probe. We don't have to worry about putting a sterile condom on the probe. We just leave it on the non-sterile side and then put our hole here. As you can see right there is our, our little um, blue mark from our pre-scan where we know we're going to put the probe. So here's our approach with our needle now. And uh, here's a little closer view. So on our view, it looked like I wanted to be about a centimeter and a half uh, with my approach. And so we've got the, the probe here, and I've guesstimated about a centimeter and a half below the, the probe to the needle approach so I can angle in under the dorsal scapular nerve and get to the, uh, the plexus. So here's our approach, one, one and a half centimeters. Here comes our needle. We're trying to get over here. Here's C5, six, and six. And we're trying to get into this space here. We're coming in, you'll see the needle approach across again like we saw in the earlier pictures. And here's our needle. With this approach, you see the needle extremely well in an in-plane view. You can see the whole shaft of the needle. You should be able to see the tip extremely well. And I usually have the TUI pointed up uh, towards the probe, and you, you can usually tell the two, which way the, uh, the uh, opening of the TUI is, is headed and the way you've got it directed so that our catheter is going to start coming out this way when we start threading the catheter. You can also see we've got, we're going to open up this space here with, uh, with our local. And here we are. We're going to see the approach with our needle in this video. It's going to come across. We're going to try to get right in here. And then we'll start injecting with local. We're going to go right under the dorsal scapular nerve there. We got no twitch, so we proceeded. Now we're in the space. We pop through the middle scalene muscle. And we'll start injecting. You'll see the local spread. And I'll go right up to C5 with the tip of the needle. Try to inject some local there and spread. Open up the space between our sheath and the middle scalene muscle. Now here we're going to see an, another video of injection. The needle's already up here. We're going to watch it inject local. There you can see the local spreading. Here's our nerves over here. I can move the needle up and down, open up this space here with local anesthetic. Now here we are. 
when I start, when I get this space open here with local and open up between the nerves and the middle scalene muscle, we're going to thread our catheter in this space. I'm going to take the needle, run it right up here to C5, and then we'll thread the, the catheter right out. You can see the tip of the catheter coming out right under there. Uh, and initially, we're going to th I'm going to thread out about a half a centimeter to a centimeter there, and then pull the needle down to this area and thread catheter and watch it and watch it flip over like that. So here again, I'm setting up here about C5. You can see the catheter coming out of the needle, and I'm just moving my needle from C5 down to here, and then I'll continue threading down here to make the flip. Again, now this, this is where, when I'm doing the initial injections, injecting the local uh, infiltration and the local through the needle, I'm holding the probe. At this point, obviously, I have to have a third hand, and my nurse is holding the probe underneath that sheath in a non-sterile fashion, but holding it where I can see my needle and see my catheter come out of the needle. Now here we go, I just I bring the needle from the top, I thread out that, cath that catheter just a little bit, about a centimeter, then I bring my needle from there to here. When I do, the needle's here and the catheter is laying at this point. So that when I start threading the catheter against this sheath of the nerves, I'm gonna thread here, the catheter's gonna come out about this angle and it's gonna push up and the tip's sitting right there and that tip's gonna flip over. And we'll show you in the video just how that works. Here we are threading the catheter in posteriorly, and then here we go. We're going to watch how this catheter flips. You can see the needle here. You can see the catheter coming out, and then we'll watch this video of how the catheter flips. See, there comes the catheter out. I come down. I keep threading. You see the catheter flip right over. Then I'll thread back up with the needle. We're back up at C5, come down again, and flip over again. You can see the tip of the catheter right there. Once we're done with that, uh, we'll pull the, the needle out and then check our catheter. Now here you are. We're going to check our um, our um, we're going to check our catheter. It's already been placed. Here's um, the nerves, and we're going to look right here for our local infiltration through the catheter. And you can see it right there. See the local spreading. Just posterior to the nerves, and anterior to the middle scalene. And keep it all down local down here, away from our phrenic nerve that's sitting up here on the anterior scalene in front of the plexus. So you can see we keep a little air in the catheter there. You can see our catheter here. See how our local all spreads down this way, and none of it going over the top of C5 towards the phrenic nerve. Now, I'm not going to tell you that we never get a phrenic nerve involvement. I won't tell you that. I can tell you I don't think we've had anybody hospitalized since we started doing this. Occasionally you'll get somebody that's a little symptomatic, but they've been doing extremely well. Now we're going to thread a catheter again, and I think this is the one we're going to thread the catheter and actually watch the uh, testos. So here comes the catheter, pulling the needle down. As you can see, we're going to flip. There goes the catheter flipping over. You'll actually see the plexus, the nerves move a little bit. Come up with the catheter again. We're threading again against the lower part of the plexus and making the catheter flip over the top. We'll pull the catheter, or pull the needle out, excuse me. And then we'll take a second to hook up our clip to inject through the catheter. Here's our nurse. We're going to look for a little local ex ex explosion right in there. Now, you see the local spreading in this area right here. It was kind of hard to see, but you can see the nerves again, C5, C6, C6, and we had local spreading in this area, which is perfect. Again, keeping our local posterior to the plexus away from the anterior scalene and away from the phrenic nerve right there. So here's a video. We're going to walk through the steps here on a patient. You can see we've done our pre-scan. We've got our marks there. I'm going to put my drape down. That's where my our probe is going to go right here. Putting our drape down where our hole is going to be posterior in our drape. And then the drape is going to flip right over. And then we'll be able to slide our probe underneath in a non sterile fashion. And when I'm threading the catheter, that allows for my, uh, my assistant, my block nurse, to be able to hold the probe for me. And I can watch the catheter as it comes out of the tip of the needle. And we can watch it flip right over. 
in a posterior fashion. Uh, I had one guest one time was watching us do it, and he uh, he called it a, a gainer. He called it like doing a full gainer. And uh, so we're getting ready to do a, um, our posterior um, injection. First thing we're going to do is hook up our nerve stimulator, and then we're going to hook, hook up our local anesthetic. We're going to flush our needle, make sure it's good and flush. There's no air in the line with the needle or the tubing so that when we're injecting, it's just going to be a local anesthetic and uh, not air. Now we're putting the probe in under the drape. You can see how the nurse comes in, puts the probe on the, on the, uh, on the neck where we had it pre-scanned. Now you can see our anterior scaling here. You can see our plexus right there. Uh, sternocleidomastoid up here on top. And our middle scalene here with our dorsal scapular nerve right there in the middle of the middle scalene muscle. You can see the dorsal scapular right there. Right in the middle, he's got a very nice middle scalene muscle. Uh, the anterior scalene is usually a nice round muscle. Uh, and then the middle scalene is kind of triangular. I kind of call it the New England Patriots sign. It kind of looks like the thing on the New England Patriots helmet. If I can get it on, there it is. Um, so what we're going to do, again, we got one centimeter down, two centimeters deep. I'm going to come in somewhere between one and a half and two centimeters at the skin. I'm looking at the probe, eyeballing it to come in probably about one and a half, I hope. Yep, coming in about, two, well, between one and a half and two. So here comes our needle straight across, deep to the dorsal scapular nerve. We're going to get right up into the, into, the, into the area between the middle scalene muscle and the nerve sheath. Now, I'm pushing a little hard now. This is an older video, so I, I don't push on the nerves. Now you can see they're local going in there, opening up our space right here between the nerves and the middle scalene muscle. I, I usually do three injections of five cc's. There's one injection. That's two injections of five cc's. And then here comes our third injection. Again, opening up our space quite well here, keeping all of our local. See, you don't see any local spreading over the top. There, there probably is. We just don't see it. Uh, it almost looks like this sheath or this, this layer uh, coming over the middle scaling muscle kind of keeps our local down, which is helpful. Uh, I can't say for sure none's getting over there, but it just doesn't look like it. Like it. Now we'll start threading our catheter. You can see the catheter actually come through the sheet there, or come through the needle there. So I'm going to take the needle and put it right up on C5, right up here. See the catheter come out there, laying right over C5. Then I pull the needle down, and then we're going to thread against C6 and make the top of the catheter flip right over. You can see the nerves moving. And then when we get to the bottom, I'll thread thread catheter as we bring the needle back up to here to C5 again. And there's our needle. And then I'll come back down and we're going to thread there. And you can see the tip of the catheter over here. See how it's going to be in the middle here and then we'll check with, we'll inject local and uh, look at our spread. It should open up this area right here between the plexus and the middle scalene muscle. So here we are getting ready to do our test dose. We're going to look, and right there you can see our spread of local right in there in this area. We kind of actually push the nerves to the left as we inject it. I actually shot a little burst of air through there. You saw a little white. Uh, explosion right there is where I put like a quarter cc of air in there just to double check and show where the catheter was and uh, it looked it looked perfect so our local spread was there in that posterior gutter and uh, now we'll uh, we'll finish up uh, tunnel our catheter and be done so when we're done 
and we pull the catheter out. I'm going to tunnel the catheter under the skin about a centimeter or two just to get it away from our sterile field. We're starting out posteriorly out of the field, and we're going to even get a little further away from the surgeons. I used to tunnel all my catheters when I started. Uh, that goes back to what we used to do in the 90s. And now the only catheter I tunnel is this interscaling. And it's just a little bit, just to help secure it and get it out of the surgical, out of the sterile field. I'll take that TUI that we use, start about a centimeter or two away, and come towards our catheter, uh, get a little close. I want to leave a millimeter or two skin bridge when we pull it through. And we'll pull the, the, the catheter back through the needle. And then we went in there initially, and now we're coming out over here. That gives us a little room. Uh, to, I like to curly cue the catheter and put a tegaderm on it, and uh, it's going to look like this when we're finished. I just make a little curl, bring the catheter out of the way. Uh, we usually we put a little uh, piece of tape on our, our connector to keep the catheter from being pulled out of the catheter, out of the connector, excuse me. And then a lot of times we'll just lay it right under their, their hat there. And as you can see, uh, we're way out of the surgical field up here, and back here posteriorly, not anteriorly, uh, which is also in the surgical field, and the catheter moves tremendously uh, when, uh, when they're moving their neck. Actually, I forgot to mention back in 1991, we tried putting anterior interscaling catheters in. Um, we were way ahead of our time, but the patient, we did about four or five, and the patients moved their neck, and the catheters all came out, so they didn't work well. Another reason I like this posterior approach it's the, the catheter is very secure. It's not getting as much movement as when patients are moving their necks. And uh, so I feel like it's a little more stable. So that kind of concludes our, uh, our talk on the interscaling uh, uh, catheter replacement utilizing the Hickman flip. And here's a little picture my wife took, as you can see her coffee cup down here on our pier. And a view of the beautiful uh, uh, Santa Rosa Sound looking over at Gulf Breeze. Now, this was, a, this was an area where we we're going to put questions. One question we commonly get is, do we inject in the sheath between the nerve roots? And we have found that there's no need to, uh, to go between C5 and C6 and put the needle in the sheath or even on past the sheath. A lot of people do that. Uh, we've been very, very successful. Matter of fact, uh, when I put 15 cc's posterior to the sheath in that little gutter, by the time... I finished putting my catheter in, securing the catheter, uh, and then have them roll back on their back. They very often have a complete motor block already, and it sets up very quick. We have a very solid block uh, by doing this without going inside the sheath. So we stay posteriorly. And so it's about time for sunset, and here's the sunsets. They're just absolutely gorgeous down here on Pensacola Beach. And I want to say thank you for watching this uh, presentation and thanks to Sonosite for allowing me the opportunity to describe a technique that has been extremely successful for me and uh, I've been very happy to share it with you. Thank you.